Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar. My name is Adam, Content Marketing Specialist with Henry Shine, and I'll be your moderator. Today, we are joined by Dr. Christian Brennis, who will discuss the Colzer Cara I-500 Intraoral Scanner. If you have questions, please type them into the Q&A section of your control panel, and we will cover them at the end of the webinar. This webinar is presented by Henry Shine Dental, and no CE credits are being offered for viewing this presentation. Dr. Brennis is a prosthodontist, international speaker, and clinical researcher. Thanks for being with us, Dr. Brennis. The floor is yours. My pleasure. Thank you, Adam. So uh, we're going to be talking about Cara, um, Colser Cara I-500, which is basically um, a great scanner, in my opinion. Um, you know, we're going to go through the some tips and tricks about how to use the scanner. It's unbelievable how nowadays we can get into digital dentistry for as low as maybe twenty twenty one thousand dollars that was something impossible back in the days investing more than you know a hundred thousand dollars in some equipment and uh, just just to get the entry just to get into digital dentistry was kind of crazy so competition is always a good thing for the, for customers in general in this case dentists and also dental technicians just to give a quick intro about myself, um, as Adam said, I'm a prosthodontist. I graduated from uh, UNC, and um, now I'm, I'm an associate professor at the Medical University of South Carolina. For the people that do know me, um, they know that I have um, special interests in aesthetic dentistry, dental implants, and obviously digital work workflows in general. Um, also, um, Related to 3D printing, biomaterials, scanning technologies, uh, basically everything related to it I'm interested in. So um, I have been a, um, I have been working with Medit for several years already. Uh, I was possibly one of the first uh, users with the i500 scanner. Uh, I was also the first key, uh, key opinion leader for Medit. And uh, I feel very proud of working uh, with them in terms of um, implementing new uh, functionalities and more, you know, developments into their software, uh, which is pretty cool. I mean, I've been pretty blessed to work with not only Meta, but different companies in general in the, trying to contribute to dentistry as a whole with the, this new uh, digital um, technologies. So uh, when it comes to digital dentistry itself, you know, we digital dentistry is very broad. We can talk about digital ortho, digital endo, um, restorative. We can talk about guided surgery. So there are so many things that are applied to digital dentistry. But now the main three components of a CADCAN system, if you will, are going to be obviously data acquisition. So basically starting with a scanner, you need to get some data uh, in order to start working with um, the CAD software, which is the second component. So basically you have data acquisition, data manipulation uh, based on your CAD software, whatever that is, it can be a chair site software, it can be a lab software. It can get as complicated as you know, uh, doing implant supported prosthesis, digital dangers, you name it. We can basically do it all right now when it comes to designing. And obviously the end um, part of this will be manufacturing. So we only have two technologies, 3D printing, which is um, additive manufacturing or subtraction, which is milling. So um, for clinicians, um, many different workloads have been implemented, but now in order to enter digital industry, in order to start working with digital files, you need to get the data. You need to capture that data. So the first step of the chain, if you will, in order to um, have this entry into this digital world will be to work with a scanner. I mean, it is uh, the first step and it's basically the one that benefits uh, clinicians the most, dentists in general, having to get an internal scanner, know how to use it. Now you can quickly capture uh, or basically taking digital impressions instead of taking, you know, traditional PBS impressions, less messy, way quicker, more efficient, and obviously has a way better return on investment, not because you're saving on materials, but mostly because you're saving in time. And that's the most important thing. Number one commodity right now 
is how much time you can save, how efficient you can be with all these different tools in order to have a real return on investment. And then at the end of the day, you will have more time for yourself. Well, or you can be translated to actually see more patients per day, which is ultimately the, the end goal of this, being more efficient and more predictable. So um, many, there are many different internal scanners in the market. Um, you know, uh, have been blessed to work with a really great team of people here at MUSC that um, most of their career have been based in comparing these technologies and getting data that we can compare scientifically and see which one is better for what application. So dentists in general, actually, they, we tend to focus too much in accuracy in full arch scans. That's uh, most of the times the number one question is, oh, well, how accurate is the scanner? And let me tell you, I mean, nowadays among the major brands, we have really decent scanners. Um, when it comes to accuracy, there might be a couple that are better than ours, but everything is within clinically significant um, um, impressions, clinically significant data that um, we cannot really argue as of right now that you know we cannot use control scanners for final impressions for crowns or many more things. But these are the two main topics. So um, when it comes to um, the main concerns, right, um, is basically knowing that if you can take something like you know, um, a, a, a final impression for a dentulous, for an dentulous arch with this kind of devices. That's still maybe the only point that we can argue when it comes to this technology. But for 98% of the um, cases that most dentists do, uh, which are basically crowns, bridges, even full mouth rehabilitation with crowns, um, this is not something to argue about anymore. I think personally, and I believe the main focus instead of being how many microns or how accurate our intral scanners are, and if we can actually take a full arch scan, is based on what kind of integration we can have with these devices and what are the software capabilities. I think nowadays, knowing that everything is within clinically um, proven results, if you will, um, the main thing is how well this can be integrated to my practice. And um, when it comes to this, um, we need to actually work this in a reverse engineering perspective, if you will, and try to see what kind of practice you have and what kind of components you will need in order to make that practice more efficient and have more predictable results. So, um, we have to actually uh, change the way we think about this. Uh, back in the days, people were basically adapting their practices to the system they were buying. Um, so if you were buying a chair site system, just because it was one of the, or the only option or one of the main options in the market, but you were not doing chair site that much, it doesn't really make sense. Now, if um, you're doing, um, for example, a lot of, you know, uh, implant supported restorations, or if you're doing a lot of ventures, different things, you can accommodate these intro scanners to work with the best software for it and actually work with the best manufacturing hardware for it. So I think integration is clue when it comes to how we should implement digital technologies in our practices. And always, obviously, software capabilities includes uh, many things, but um, also includes some uh, things like maintenance fees. So what is the cost associated with buying the system and what is the cost associated with actually having that system for many years? So some companies will charge you for maintenance fees. Some companies will charge you for updates. Um, and um, depending on how often these are available, um, you will have to pay out of pocket for it. It doesn't come with the hardware. So it's something that is important to take into consideration 
um, when we choose what internal scanner uh, we're going to be using and what company we really want to work with. And it might worth it. I mean, I'm not saying that maintenance fees are, no, you know, um, nonsense. It might worth paying for the commodity if you really need to have that scanner. But um, sometimes it just makes sense to know exactly how companies work and then just go from there. Because when it comes to, you know, some more companies that you will pay way more for an info scanner, and actually you have to pay every single year for it, it ups up pretty quickly. So at this point um, of time, uh, most of dental practices are based on two different concepts. One is a modular concept, which is basically integration of different hardwares and softwares. So it might be that the practitioner only wants to deal with just one company and have or being able to scan with their brand, design with their brand, and then also manufacture with their materials. Um, so everything stays in within one single brand. It's obviously easier when it comes to, you know, how you can integrate different parts. But um, also another thing is if, if you, are choosing to go through this route, you will pay that premium. And usually you will have to buy the whole package right up front. So some more practices, um, they have chosen to go through a more modular approach and being able to um, be able to work with different companies and then start integrating different parts as they progress. So you don't have to start with a whole um, complete system and have mills and have printers and have CAD softwares and it, it doesn't make sense. I mean you can start with a very affordable internal scanner that will be the number one step. You can get all the data that you need and then start outsourcing some of these things. Now if you do have an in-house lab obviously it makes sense to start eventually progressing into a more digital workflow that will involve all these different components and parts. So um, you will have more control. And on the other hand, you will be able to integrate many, many more things because you're not basically, depending upon what a company is offering you, you just basically choose what you need and you can integrate. So this concept has been there for many years. It's obviously now a little bit more obvious because we have a lot of different brands, a lot of different companies, a lot of competition going on, which is a good thing. I mean, at the end of the day, what we want, most of the clinicians, what we want is really a really easy workflow, but obviously having the freedom to choose what we actually have to um, use in our practices. So when we talk about integration, we are talking about that freedom that comes with what we call open architecture or basically open uh, files that we can use. Not every single brand, not every single internal scanner is going to let you export models and restorations and everything that you need to any software. So open architecture means that you're going to be working with files that are open and that are going to let you as a clinician being able to send it to any lab anywhere, anywhere in the world um, to be able to use those files to design crowns, design restorations in general, or maybe even design and manufacture those and send them back to you right away. So it's a way more efficient um, way of practicing right now. Right now, obviously, we don't have to chip models. We don't have to rely on how fast the dental lab is going to get those models. <clears throat> and um, they can get it in just a matter of seconds. Um, I would just call my lab guy and say, hey, listen, I already um, send the files to you. Go ahead and take a look, design them, and send me the crowns. So it's way more efficient, and it's obviously way more predictable in a way that, you know, you have control over that data. And you always have access to that data. It's not like one impression is going to get lost and you're not going to get things back from the lab. Um, you always have control of that data. And I will, I will cover this um, later um, with some of the functions that the um, I-500 scanner has. Um, so again, it's just a matter of having that freedom. Some companies only specialize in single components 
In this case, MEDIT is specialized only in scanning technologies. They don't do designing software. They don't do mails. They don't do CBCT units. They don't do uh, 3D printers. They don't make any of this because they're so focused on scanning technologies that that's their main um, niche, if, if you will. Um, versus, you know, a company that does it all, which is really difficult. I mean, we usually play this joke about like, um, I mean, nobody can be LeBron James in the industry, right? Nobody can do all the different or best, you know, equipment, software, best everything for you to be able to just use one brand in your practice. Uh, we see that a lot, um, but that's not the case. I mean, I think freedom is really important when it comes to implementing these kind of things. So um, what about the different workflows? I mean, as clinicians, what kind of workloads do we have? Basically, it all comes down to knowing that depending on the practice that you have, you have to implement one of these four workflows. Um, as I said, you should start with an intro scanner. That's basically data acquisition. Based on that data acquisition, uh, when you have something like the i500 scanner, you have access to something called method link. We're going to discuss that a little bit later in what some of my slides. But method link is a way for you to be able to scan your patient and then send that data through a very secure cloud service that will allow your technician to pull it from there and start working. Obviously, we have to be HIPAA compliant, but on the other hand, there are no um, secure ways with some more systems to send that data right away. You have to, yes, you, I mean, you can put it on a USB drive and send it, or you can email it, um, or you can do a lot of different things, but this is not a secure way of doing things. So you can start with um, using the intro scanner and just scan your patients. You don't have to do it all. Um, you know, I get these questions all the time and people, we used to think that digital industry is just a way of trying to do everything. And that's not the case. I mean, we just have to focus on what we do best. We don't have to be the one that scans the patient and designs everything and manufactures everything. So this is one way of practicing. And this is most of the times the entry to digital dentistry, just get an intro scanner, get the data and keep working with your lab. No, not everybody has to be a lab technician. Um, a second way of doing this is data acquisition in CAM, meaning you can scan your patient, send it to a designer. Um, they will send you the file backing within hours, maybe even minutes, and then you will be able to mail those restorations in house. We um, see this a lot. Um, I have a small um, lab on the side in a lot of things that we uh, do for um, many of um, the people that we work with is to just design and send the files back so they can mail or print in their own office. It's a, it's a great deal. Um, so they don't have to um, have their staff trained. Um, they can have somebody that is very, very good when it comes to designing, doing those designs for them. The only thing they have to do is to put it in the machine and manufacture them. Um, another way is data acquisition in CAD. Some people are really good designers or they want to be trained on how to design, but they just don't want to deal with the fact that they have to buy mails and 3D printers. Uh, they just don't want the mess of manufacturing, maybe powder, uh, maybe, you know, resins, they have to buy resins, it gets kind of messy sometimes. There are some people that don't want to deal with that. So they can train, um, they can get trained or they can train their staff to scan the patients, design the restoration, and they can send it somewhere else to be manufactured so they don't have to um, be um, or incur any expenses of buying blocks, pucks, even burrs, paying for the mails or the printers. So it is, it is very convenient depending on what you choose to do. Uh, the last um, way uh, will be to do a full chair side lab. So a full CAD CAM workflow will be uh, to have basically an in-house lab that um, you will have full control. So you can scan your patient, you can design, 
and then you can 3D print or um, mail your own restorations in house. But notice that everything starts with scanning. You need to learn, you need to know how to scan in order to implement any of these workflows. Um, doesn't matter what you do, even if you take a PBS impression and you send it to the lab, at the end of the day, they're gonna, they're going to scan that impression. It's gonna end up in a digital workflow. Um, now, why not just be more efficient at it? Why not just accelerating the process, send them to the lab quicker and um, having some return on investment while we're doing the same thing. Um, so I was um, mentioning MetaLink and MetaLink is one of the most powerful tools in, I mean, in my opinion, that the um, I-500 scanner has. Um, there is no um, or company as of right now that has such a powerful tool like working in the cloud. So what happens? You scan a patient, and when you scan a patient, that information is gonna be stored in the cloud. So for some people it's like, well, you know, what is that special? Well, it is special because at the end of the day, you're not depending on a computer. So if something happens to that computer that you have, you're gonna lose your data unless you have a backup. But you don't have to manually go there and back up all the information. The information can be on the cloud. For me, for example, um, if I just quickly want to access the data, I can access the data from my home. I can scan a patient sometimes. I can do, uh, you know, I can do presentations, but I can also go ahead and if I'm going to, going to design a case, I can pull the data from the cloud from any computer. Um, it's just like having, you know, Dropbox. It's basically a different version of Bo a Dropbox. It's a dental version of Dropbox. And then from there, pull the data and um, start working um, from anywhere in the world. So that's very convenient for people that are going from you know, practice to practice, knowing that if something happens to that computer, um, they always have the information right there. And what is more valuable, I mean, you can replace the hardware, you can replace one computer for another computer, but if you lose the data, that's when it really hurts. So um, this is something um, that um, is very powerful and it's also um, help, helping clinicians and lab technicians to communicate better because if everybody works within the same environment and I can send this information to my dental um, technician, once I scan the patient, it gets uploaded to the cloud, they can pull it up from there right away. So it's very convenient. and. Um, is is very is very basically easy access to the data which is the most important thing about this kind of workflows um now that's about integration what about software capabilities um what are we going to be able to do with this specific scanner that we cannot possibly do with some more systems um, as I was mentioning, um, as of right now, most of the systems are open, so you can have or you can pull files from the from um, the from their software. Something that you have to be aware is that even though they're open, some of them are not uh, providing you with um, the files that you want. In other words, they can be open. And for the people that are now in, in digital industry, they know what I'm talking about, but you can basically pull STL files out of it. Basically, it's just an open format um, that you can uh, get from different um, scanning systems to start working. So it's an open format, but it doesn't have color. So a lot of systems doesn't even allow you to export that data with color. Why is this important? It's not because we're gonna be taking a shade or things like that is because it's way easier for the dental technicians to be able to differentiate in between what is tooth structure and what is soft tissue, for example. So if you're prepping a tooth and yeah, I mean, with some more systems, you're able to take the data out of there and send it to your technician, but if they don't see the color, sometimes it's way more difficult for them to know exactly where the margin is. So it's just way more predictable um, if you're able to export files like PLY or OBJ for this kind of purposes. No annual fees. 
I'm a huge believer that if you pay for a system, you should own the system. So, uh, you know, it doesn't make sense for me if, if you're going to be paying for a system that you have to keep paying every single year just to keep it working. Um, but anyway, it's just one of the things that I think consumers, in this case, dentists and the dental technicians should be aware so we can actually push companies to say, hey, listen, I'm already, pay a lot, I'm already paying a lot of money for this. Uh, why am I not getting the updates or why my, my software is not working after a year? I got to keep paying for this. Sometimes people will not give you that information that is important for you to be aware of this. Um, and it's obviously uh, way more affordable. Um, you know, you can have an intro scanner now for around $25, um, $21,000, um, including the scanner and the computer itself. You need to get a really good computer, of course. So back in the days, basically, the cheapest you can go was twice the price, uh, which is insane. So it was a true revolution when they came with um, such an affordable scanner that was going to revolutionize, um, you know, how much we were paying for, or actually just to get the entry into the digital dentistry. When it comes to um, updates, I think, you know, most companies will basically update their systems once a year, maybe, uh, some of them not even, sometimes two or uh, three years after. So, um, you know, when you check this and you see MetaLink updates, uh, at least this is for the last quarter, quarter of 2019, um, you can see almost around like 12 different updates in 1.5 years. Well, it's, it's pretty good. I mean, you're not getting charged for this and it means the software keeps getting better and better. Uh, sometimes better speed, uh, better accuracy, uh, better functions, and you don't have to pay for them. Why? If you already pay for the hardware, right? So it just makes uh, a lot of sense uh, when, when I see a company that is trying to evolve uh, like this. I think of this like sometimes David versus Goliath, you know, the small companies are trying to give you a lot of value that really big companies are not giving you. So they, at the end of the day, they win, you know, because consumers are going to start choosing this kind of things instead of paying for that premium. That is nonsense. Um, um, again, when it comes to um, the um, analysis or powerful tools that we will have within MetaLink, um, it's not only about the scanning tools that you will have, it's also about data analysis. And what I mean by that is um, something, for example, like they have is uh, called Dashboard. So in Dashboard, you're able to track and see how many cases you're doing how many cases you're referring to, what lab, um, how many crowns versus inlays versus onlays you're doing. So it's, it's pretty cool to have that analysis within the same system. Um, that way, if you're really good in, or, or if you're really into numbers that you should be, you know, with, within your practice, you're able to get all these numbers, analyze what you're doing, and maybe, um, uh, give you a better idea of what uh, kind of procedures are being more profitable and what kind of things you should be more focused on. So let's go and check some clinical cases. I mean, this is the meat of the presentation. I only have one hour uh, with you guys. So I just want to show just a few cases, um, two cases, um, and show the everyday dentistry that we do. Um, in this case, the first case is going to be about um, everyday restorative. So what I mean by that is th uh, people think that we're only doing um, crowns with internal scanners. And that's the only purpose of having an internal scanner is because every time that you're going to be taking a impression is to do or to make crowns. But this is not the reality. I mean, I use internal scanners for basically every single patient, even for diagnostic purposes. I scan my patients, 
and I get to see a lot of information that I'm not going to be able to see with just models. I can zoom in, zoom out, and uh, this is actually one of the coolest applications. Um, sometimes we'll present, you know, a patient will present to our practice, and uh, the patient is going to be complaining about possible, um, you know, uh, chip incisal the ledges, and the patient is looking to get some kind of direct or bonded composites. Um, so can we use a neutral scanner for this? Yes, of course. So we can scan our patients, get that diagnosis, see what is going on with their occlusion. But also, once we have those scans, we can go ahead and do a quick wax up. It doesn't take long, it takes just a few minutes. And if you do have a wax up, then you can basically uh, get a model that you can print, really tiny model that you can print. I know there are some guys out there and there might be a couple of you guys that are going to be like, well, all that work, I can do it freehand. Of course, there are a lot of talented and, and really good clinicians when it comes to this. But if you can have a model and if you can reduce the chair time and just have a jig that will tell you how much you need to add to those incisal edges, basically just having a wax up, a quick wax up that will tell you and guide you so you can shorten the, um, the, uh, the, the appointments, um, that's a way more efficient workflow. So this is a case that was done with Dr. Mario Romero from um, Augusta University. Um, and he was the one actually doing the direct bonding composites. So this is how the patient was. And you can see we use that model to fabricate this little potty jig and that little potty jig was telling Dr. Romero how much he will have to add to those incisal edges to have a better aesthetic result for this patient. It doesn't take him really long. I mean, he's really talented, but obviously the guessing factor is not there anymore. So uh, with the wax up, he can quickly go ahead, edge, uh, bond, and finish up those direct restorations in having a result that is um, very, I mean, first of all, it was very efficient. And second, it was very predictable because he didn't have to guess how much to add to those incisal edges. And the occlusion was already there. So you can see that before and after, um, it's not, a, I mean, it's not one of those, um, you know, cases that you have uh, the wow factor, you know, the before and after, but this is everyday dentistry. So I want you to say what is possible and that you will be able to use this scanner for almost every case in your practice. So we're going through that transition of, um, you know, back in the days, the only reason where you were, um, why you were um, basically using intraoral scanners was to do crown and bridge. Now we use it for almost every single procedure. Um, so case number two, this is a very nice case. Um, we used the combination of the I-500 with ExoCAD and then um, some 3D printing with um, a Sega printer and uh, roll-on bills. So we did everything in house. I did this with uh, one of my residents actually. And um, it was pretty, it's pretty nice to see how they um, get very motivated and they understand the new workflows in the industry. One of the most interesting things about scanning technologies that we didn't have in the past was that in order to kind of replicate nature, um, you were, you, you have to be talented gifted. You have to be gifted with this talent of being able to replicate what you see in nature. Um, many dental technicians have this gift, but this has opened the doors uh, to us to be able to replicate nature in its shape. We will still obviously need to rely on really talented people to get the custom shades and the colors and the translucency and have that eye to uh, choose the right material you know, for every single patient. But in terms of shape, knowing that we can scan nature and we can, we can replicate nature is one of the most incredible things about this, quite honestly. 
So um, different softwares, um, they have um, now digital libraries. You can create your own digital libraries. If you see a patient that has some beautiful teeth, you can scan that patient. And then you can use that as um, a possible library um, to um, use it in another patient. So that's something that is possible. Some softwares already have um, libraries or natural libraries that are integrated into their own, their own um, designs in order to achieve these uh, more, this more natural look, if you will. So this is how the patient showed up. Um, she came to our practice asking for a more static smile. Uh, whatever that is, we need to go through a series of questions and try to see what uh, the patient is actually talking about. But mainly, she was referring to uneven um, inside the ledges. You can see how uneven those were. And uh, she was also complaining about the stains, um, smoking stains, coffee stains. But mostly, it was how asymmetrical those teeth um, were. So what we did was quickly scan the patient. Uh, we got the um, intral scanner, scan the patient, upper, lower arch, and the bite. And then we throw this information into our CAT software, um, doing something um, like a 3D smile design um, that can be done you know, fairly quickly. In this case, we're working from first premolar to first premolar. And we can also evaluate the occlusion of this patient. So we can go ahead and use these digital articulators to um, guide us um, in terms of the design. So we can replicate or try to replicate protrusive movements, lateral protrusive movements, uh, and see if those restorations that we're going to be doing are going to follow up the principles of occlusion. Once we have the ideal wax up, we will um get that model we can print that model and we can create a potty jig that is going to guide us and is going to basically provide us or pro provide me and the patient with a mock-up so we can do a quick mock-up this is the picture that you see right there so with that mock-up we can have a second chance we can the first step is to show this result of the patient the patient's you know, they think it's Photoshop, they don't think it's real. Once you do the mock-up, they actually get it. They actually, um, they can see the possible final result and they can provide us valuable feedback um, about the, um, the thickness of those possible restorations, about the length, about the statics. Uh, what is it that they want to change? So this is very powerful. We can do this mock-up. And the second thing that is nice about this mockup is once I have this mockup, I can prep through the mockup. So this kind of workflows have guide us into a more conservative philosophy about dentistry. So back in the days, we were just like, in our minds, we were thinking about the ideal thickness of our restorations without considering the final shapes of the restorations. So we were basically just grinding on tape, knowing that you should achieve one, maybe one and a half millimeters. Um, and we, we, were, we were reducing those teeth to almost nothing. Nowadays, we are able to basically um, reduce through the mockups and use those mockups as a reduction guide. Um, you can see how conservative that is. And um, from there, we're able to um, basically scan the patient a second time and design our restorations. In this case, it was um, minimally prepped. We uh, preserved a lot of enamel, which is the final outcome. Um, the final outcome is going to be much better if you preserve enamel. You have better bonding. Um, it's just at the end of the day, it's way better. Now, what are the cool things about this? Like within uh, MedLink, once you are able to scan your patient, you are able to also reevaluate the occlusion. So let me show you a quick video about this. So you can scan your patient, upper, lower arch, bite, 
you have actually the opportunity to scan two bytes if you really want to align things a little better and um, just have a more accurate byte registration. And once you scan the byte, you are able to see the intensity of those contacts, which is pretty cool. Uh, now you have your own digital articulating paper uh, because you can evaluate this in the intensity of these contacts, intensity of the byte um, within the same software. You don't have to buy a special software. You don't have to basically, um, you know, monkey around with articulating paper here and there, um, even though you can, but you can still have this second way of evaluating the occlusion and go from there. This is another cool thing. If you already prep your patient and you're working with your dental technician, um, you can actually, if, if they're using a compatible software like Exocat, um, you are able within the same software to draw your margin. This is so, very powerful because you can tell your technician, this is where the margin is. And this is where I want you to design the restorations. Uh, they don't have to guess is a way uh, is way better in terms of communicating, you know, with a technician um, and tell them exactly what you really want and how you want it. Um, there is one more thing too. Um, let's say this, you know, you're working with a patient that also has a combination of preps and implants, and that happens a lot. So this is not only limited to natural teeth, you can also, within the same software, this is a video that was chaired by Dr. Um, Arben Mersayan, and he, um, he is showing how you're able to also import custom abutments or abutments in general as open files within the same software. You can scan it and then you can uh, fool the software telling uh, basically the software like this is a preparation. I want to have the margin based on this as if it was a tooth prep. So you can use a combination of teeth, you can also um, uh, teeth and implants, and you can draw the margin for the teeth and for the implants, which is really powerful. You can see there um, how when there is a functionality within the same software in which you can align things, so you don't have to scan perfectly that custom abutment. Every time that you have a custom abutment, your lab can provide you with the file um, the, that, what you, that was used uh, to mail the custom abutment. So that file, if they give you the file, or if you already have a STL file of the implant library that you're gonna be using, you can import that into the software, scan just a little bit of that um, in the mouth, and the software is gonna automatically align the data. So it's way more accurate. Um, you end up with any, um, let's call it bubbles, or uh, data that you, you, know, you, you don't capture, you get some little holes uh, every now and then, you're not gonna get it with this because you already have the file that you need in order to merge both data sets, which is pretty nice. So going back to the case, um, we ended up um, basically scanning the patient. Since this was made in house, we already know where the margins were, so we didn't have to trace them and send them to a lab technician. But um, we basically just followed the same protocol. So we scan the patient, we use the pre-op, basically the mock-up as a pre-op um, in order to give us the ideal position for the final restorations. And we basically, what we do is cheating. Um, why? Because we can tell the software, hey, listen, I just wanna get a copy of my pre-op situation, which is the WOXUP and I want to have my final restorations being a clone of that pre -op. So this is what we end up having right here after the patient gave us the thumbs up and she said, yeah, I like how, you know, the way this looks. Um, I love um, the way I can speak. Um, the F and V sound doesn't look weird. I like the way they look. Now we can go ahead and basically clone that pre-op 
with the final restorations like you see in the screen. We basically mail those, we stain and glaze, and then we follow the bonding protocol. These restorations were Empress. Uh, we're just doing veneer. So Empress is a beautiful material when it comes to um, this kind of um, restorations. Uh, it, provides, it provides really great translucency on you know, the over hand. Uh, we have great bonding with Empress. Uh, I know people, for the most part, they like uh, lithium disilicate. We do as well. We do a lot of restorations with lithium disilicate, but this was one of those cases in which we try different materials and we opt uh, for um, Empress too in this case. So um, you can see we go through the etching, bonding, curing, and then getting rid of the excess of cement. And um, you know, applying these stains um, and creating some natural texture, it really gives sometimes this crazy natural look to it. Uh, so when the patient, when we showed their final restorations that were bonded, uh, the patient was very happy. Um, she said they look like natural teeth. Uh, patients nowadays are looking for more of a um, natural smile, uh, not the perfect smile, uh, but the natural smile. She wanted to have something that was just replacing what was missing, but matching the lower teeth, the texture, and the color. Um, and you can see how they look. They look really natural. That's the final smile right there on the screen. Um, this is a close-up right there. Some internal, not even internal, they look like internal, but some external uh, stains that look like internal um, effects on the teeth. And that was her, pretty happy. You can see from this view um, how much we were replacing buccal lingually. Um, so basically, again, trying to preserve all the possible enamel so we can have very predictable bonding in the, um, uh, for our restorations. And we're just basically replacing what is missing. But this is one of the most powerful workflows that you can have when it comes to digital dentistry. And, um, Obviously, you need, to, you need to start with um, an internal scanner at the end of the day because that is, when, that is what um, is going to open the doors for you to be able to evaluate uh, um, this kind of cases, to be able to be more efficient, and to be able to, if you want to jump into design, provide you the data that you need in order to get at least started. Um, again, not everybody has to be a dental technician. I think that is nonsense because our time um, is valued um, in the chair. I mean, it's chair time. What is uh, the, the real return investment in a dental practice is not the time that we spend as dental technicians. Uh, but having said that, is going to provide you some return investment if you choose to slowly progress into these digital workflows, of course. So um, that was the second case. Um, I will just go back to Adam and see if there are any questions about this that I can address um, for all of you guys. Great, thank you. We do have some questions and if anyone does have additional questions, please type them into the Q&A and we will get to as many as we can. Um, one person is wondering if you can elaborate a little more on the return on the investment with the scanner. Yeah, it's a little different for every practice, of course, right? So I get a lot of students, they get hype and uh, they get super motivated and they say, hey, you know, Dr. Brannis, now that I learned everything uh, here when it comes to, you know, the, the workflows, I'm super eager. I want to buy my intro scanner right now and I want to buy this software, et cetera. Uh, the thing is, you need to know your numbers. I mean, just like every, anything else in, in your practice, you need to actually know your numbers and see how many, actually know how many crowns you're doing per month or how many restorations so you can make sense of the investment. For most people, uh, it's a no-brainer, quite honestly. Uh, but obviously, you know, when it comes to um, a really affordable scanner, it just makes way more sense because now you can break things into 
So what you are going to pay for, you know, another brand, you can get started with a, a scanner that is the same quality, if not better, uh, for half the price. So it makes way more sense um, uh, from that standpoint. So the return on investment is there. You just have to know that you are producing, you know, X amount of crowns um, per month in order to make sense of it. Uh, and obviously, this talks to talk to your tax professional. And there is some depreciation and things that you can get out of it, uh, being technology. But this is something that is going to be related to what kind of practice you have, how many restorations or how many patients you're seeing per month. All right, next question. Does the Medit software eliminate tongue and cheek when you scan or do you use a cut tool? Um, has both. Um, so while you're scanning, there is an algorithm that will allow you to, like if you go, if you scan a patient and the tongue is on the way and then you basically get rid of the tongue and re-scan that portion, um, it will basically delete that most softwares right now have the capability of knowing what is kind of like tooth structure, uh, tooth structure and what is not. And it will delete what is not tooth structure and recapture the, the teeth. <coughs> so the answer is yes. Um, on the other hand, if you have some extra data that you want to get rid of, you also have different kind of tools there. Um, so you have a cut tool, you have a brush tool, and you also have um, something that is, um, uh, is, is very nice because if you have like little islands or actual big islands of data that is not connected to the main scan, you can just click on them and they will disappear. Um, so it's uh, super quick um, how uh, you can, you know, scan patients and get rid of that data that you don't like. How does the scanner handle those subgingival preps that we encounter from time to time with tissue that wants to bleed easily? Oh my goodness. Yeah. I mean, no matter what you do, you still have to still need to have good isolation. Doesn't matter if it is PVS, doesn't matter if it is a scanner, you still need to see your margin because if you cannot see your margin, the scanner is not going to be able to see your margin. So you're not going to be able to scan it. Um, on the other hand, um, it's all about the workflow. Um, here we teach um, our students, um, especially Dr. Wally Rene and Dr. Manito, uh, they're really big into um, you know, being very conservative when it comes to tooth preparations. And we teach our students different types of preparations in, in you know, obviously in our C courses as well, that uh, we'll teach people how to do even like better preparations, and you don't need to even get as close to the tissue. So you don't have to make the tissue angry and have some bleeding in there. Um, you can, there are some ways that um, you can prep the teeth, keep that margin super gingival, and you don't even have to pack a cord. You can go ahead, scan the tooth, and design or um, you know, provisionalize and, and send it to the lab. So it's about the workflows more than the technology. But obviously, again, technology is not a replacement for skills. Um, it's just enhancing what you already have. Can you scan for making partials or complete dentures with the scanner? Absolutely. Yeah. As a matter of fact, you can even like make a denture duplicate with an intral scanner. Um, something that is pretty cool is um, you can go to YouTube and you can see a bunch of people doing like, um, like scanning um, baseballs. Um, and then uh, what they're trying to do sometimes is to try to fool the algorithm, the software, and see if at the end of the day they can connect the, the, the stitches. You know, they can make a full scan of a ball out of an intro scanner. Sometimes you will get a lot of deformation depending on the system, but um, the algorithms within um, the software that Medi has, Medit has is pretty good. Um, I mean, quite honestly, the guys that were behind the software, um, they were behind a, an ore company that was involved in research. 
that uh, we still use nowadays, I'm not going to say any names, but that was used in order to compare 3D files. So the algorithms and the way the software is programmed is, is, is pretty good. Um, there is also an OR function. Uh, I, I quickly showed, let me just go back real quick. I will show you. this right here. If you guys can see that slide, uh, there is a function within the software that um, will tell you like, you know, the, the traffic lights is going to tell you if you have a lot of green data, that means that the data is very accurate. So as you are scanning, you can see how the data becomes more and more and more green. And the red data, is basically data that has been captured but is not 100 percent accurate so you can change that function it's on the right side in the when, when you're scanning you can basically go from you know tooth color uh to this map um, that is going to allow you to know exactly the accuracy of those um point clouds or that data that you're scanning to be a little bit more accurate. What would you say is the average scanning time for full mouth? Uh, it just depends on the clinician and their experience. Um, but I mean, average, I will say, you know, we can scan a full upper arch, including the palate, and then lower in bite registration in less than two minutes. So, that's why, you know, I think that at the end of the day, um, you know, even investing in an internal scanner is going to save you some money compared to PVS. Because when you take a traditional impression, you have to wait around like three and a half to five minutes. By the time that you're taking one, somebody else is, you know, somebody else scan already an upper, lower, and got a bite registration. Um, so it just makes sense um, because it's way more efficient. Can you add a base to your model in the Medit software? And if so, can you export it? Yeah, it's super cool. So um, at, the end of the, uh, at the end of the scanning process, the software is gonna ask you if you want to leave the data the way it is, or if you wanna close, uh, or not close, if you wanna make a base to the model. And you're able to choose in between the two options. If you click a base, it will just automatically create a base for you that you can, um, that you can use to later on print your models or you know uh, do whatever so it's, it's super easy can you use medit scan data to use in three shape in order to mill a denture uh, yes uh, because three shape allows you to uh, use sto files so it's open so uh, that's the beauty of uh, open architecture. Um, you can basically scan a danger, um, and then after you scan a danger, you have a danger duplicate. You can export that as an STL file, and then open in, um, the file in tree shape um, and go from there. So uh, yeah, the answer is yes. Do you have uh, advice as to which digital smile design software to use um digital smile design software um there are a lot of good ones um the ones that um we teach here uh, that i personally teach um is exocad uh, exocad smile creator so exocad has a module that is fully dedicated uh to a smile design uh the tree shape um the smile design module is pretty good it's extremely good too. Um, there are so many other ones out there. I mean, obviously there was a trend a couple of years ago for smile design. So there are a lot of um, small companies that uh, develop their own software. Uh, but uh, mainly um, Exocad and um, TreeShape, they have their own modules. So it's pretty, pretty easy. Now, you can even do smile design with free software. Um, that's something um, that we teach here, um, but obviously it takes a little bit more time 
and um, you will have to be you have to know the software before you even you know um, attempt to do something like that so you have to um, use softwares like mesh mixer or some other ones out there that are free and you can still do it uh, with certain techniques but you know it just it just makes sense if you're doing many cases to just have a module that is fully dedicated to this kind of things. Great. Well, that'll wrap it up for us tonight. So thank you, Dr. Brennis, for your presentation. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. If we were unable to answer your question, please feel free to email us at webinars at henryshine.com or reach out to your local Henry Shine rep. Everyone in attendance will receive a link of the recording in the coming week via email. On behalf of Henry Shine, thanks again for joining us and have a great night. Thank you.